you already found the mouse you like. I do, but you can always go better. The G Pro maybe. Why be not the just perfect. get the best one now and then <laughs> you'll have to Yeah, just because cut I, all those I, steps. because I thought it was a scam and then uh someone I respected was like this is a good mouse and then I I don't know, I'm probably not going to do it, but I would never take a recommendation for a mouse for someone I didn't respect. It was like a respected gamer talking about the final mouse. <laughs> there is no such thing. Felix is like, uh, you know, how many mouses? Do you, how many mice do you need, Felix? It's like, you know, more than I got. Never, <laughs> yeah. never enough. Fewer than I own and more than I need. Yeah. All right, Virgil. Yeah. Oh, you gotta pick up a mic. Mike. What? Yeah, it's right here. Oh, it's this. Oh, All right. Okay. We're good. All right. Oh, that was a close one, guys. Yeah. <laughs> good mechanics. Good mechanics. Good All save. Right. GG's only, guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, so today, um, I don't know if you guys saw this today, uh, a hero visited the White House today. It was a surprise mm -hmm. visit. You know, I got up this morning and I was like, emergency White House, you know, press conference, you know, meet in the Rose Garden announcement there. And what do you know it? The hero dog that killed al-Baghdadi was there with the president and Melania in the Rose Garden to, I don't know. Get the Medal of Honor or and, something? And Pence. The oh, and, oh, really? Pence was there? Uh, the brave dog who ran up to Baghdadi and bit him on the groin, and then he did the cross eyes, uh, much like in a straight-to-DVD sequel to uh, Beethoven. Beethoven second. <laughs> yeah. But uh, just like, obviously, the fact that uh, the president is giving a press conference with a fucking dog. <laughs> more and more people are saying he's the best boy. Is we literally don't deserve dogs. <laughs> Uh, but I just want to uh, highlight uh, one reaction to this today. Where, and when I saw it, like I had to actually like find the original tweet to make sure I wasn't being punked, like that it wasn't a joke or something. Comes courtesy of uh, Joan Walsh, who writes of this, of again, Trump talking to a fucking dog in front of the press. Hippo promoted to detective. She says of this, this is terrifying. Trump and Melania exude coldness to Conan the hero dog. <laughs> Melania, whose coat is slightly macabre, and then in parentheses, to me, but others may find it lovely, moves away from Conan multiple times. One out of three. What are there? I need oh, to see the other. Uh, okay, two, I need all of three of these. Well, the other ones, as, I must uh, insist, as uh, Shuja has uh, pointed out, are all about how Trump has uh, refuses to name the breed of dog, which is like. Okay, she goes on to say, uh, Trump tells you how incredible this particular type of dog is repeatedly, but he clearly can't remember the name of the breed or other details. Well, yeah, obviously. He doesn't rate dogs. He doesn't dogs. know anything. He's not the, yeah. He tells us he really wanted the dog muzzled, which tells you about his fear. <laughs> Conan is a tough cookie, we learn. Still, nothing about his breed. Trump repeatedly <laughs> jokes about sicking the dog on journalists. <laughs> also, again, his command of the language rivals maybe a five-year-old. Terrifying. But I just love it. It's just like, say the breed. Don't dead name Conan. This is it's just, uh, yeah, no, I mean, what is like a Belgian? What was macabre about the coat? Was it covered she... in little skulls or okay, something? Okay, so it was, a, it was one of those no fear hoodies that <laughs> Melania was wearing. I, from what I very can, cool. From what I can discern of it, it sort of looks like Cruella de Vil. Like maybe the coat itself is made out of other dogs uh, that have been given the Medal of Honor. Well, that's just honor. a fly look. Yeah. I like, though, that she had to say, well, to me, because she knew she was going to offend some of her, like, lib breeders who probably, like, actually do have the Cruella de Vilco. <laughs> and, of course, I think I, I like the juxtaposition with bringing the hero dog to the White House, like, on the same day that, was it his own secretary of the Navy resigned over him pardoning a war criminal fucking that? It's Eddie even Gallagher, stupider. Yeah. It's stupider than that, because he Gallagher, he bad did, boy. Gallagher is the one who got off because the guy who, the main witness... Uh, on stance changed his testimony so he was not he didn't need to be uh, pardoned but he, well, he had been disciplined uh, by uh, the navy and trump ordered all of that reversed including and apparently this is what it was all over uh the special pin that he got from fighting the special boy pin that what's it called the trident the trident pin he's a special little he's got a special little pin give him the pin and they were said sir respectfully i did not I do not sw swear to uphold the Constitution to give this man a pin. I, I refuse. And then the Secretary of the Navy resigned. And it really is amazing that so much of this horrible machinery of death is about jewelry when it comes down to it. No one's really like queenier than, oh, general, God, no. than generals and or admirals. Like the, the, 
they they need their they need their jewels. They need I, their I need my I need, I need all of my good boy pins. <laughs> Otherwise, no one will know I'm a good yeah. boy. It, the Navy SEALs are cool because like they just um their entire thing is just larceny and murdering people, <laughs> including like other people oh, in yeah. the military if they find out they're sealing. But they're like the most zero sum, like cynical, psychotic way of living your life. But they're it's also like. I'll never forget the way the day they took away my special brooch, <laughs> <laughs> my, spe- my special pin. <laughs> the worst day of dishonor ever. I mean, when the when <laughs> when the when the man with more jewelry than me said I couldn't wear <laughs> the special jewelry. When I they earned. said that I couldn't wear the brooch I wore for injecting Hugo Chavez with cancer cells, <laughs> that was I knew my country had lost its way. I mean, you think it'd be good enough just not to do any jail time for just like wantonly shooting children in a war zone. Yeah, seriously. Just but, like take the W, you fucking asshole. But it's it's the pin. Yeah. He needed they needed that too. He needs he needs a special little pin. Well anyway, uh, I just want to say congratulations to uh Conan the Hero Dog. <laughs> God. Uh, you know, I don't I don't agree with President Trump on a lot, but like I'm glad the accomplishments of, you know, the non human mem- you know, people we share this planet with um, should be recognized in some official capacity. Did you know that, like, when uh, hero dogs get home, like, hippies at the airport, like, pretend to throw tennis balls? <laughs> <and they're laughs> it's, like, really fucked up. I believe the, I believe the breed of dog of the, uh, the hero dog, though, is a uh, Belgian um, Malinois or something like that. Yeah. It was bred to, like, uh, bite miners in the Congo. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I wonder if there's just one ISIS guy who's saying to everyone else, look, 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 don't don't be so mad. It's not the dog, it's the owner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh let's start the show. Okay, uh, we are back, uh, but before we uh, begin our regularly uh, scheduled activities, uh, we have an important announcement. Oh yeah, top of, top of the morning to you, England. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, as you know, no. you're having an election, and uh, because of our pact with the devil, uh, we're coming back to you to cover the election. Ah, fuck, this sucks. <laughs> oh, no. Keep going. I thought huh. it was going well. Do it. Yeah, I thought it was going well. Oh, this God. election season. <laughs> <laughs> you got you, you it. Good you got it. up. Come on. You Go can on. Keep going. get the momentum back. Come on. This, Come on, man. Uh, you asked for this. The, Come on. The election Pay don't hurt. for Westminster, for the Palace of Westminster, <laughs> <laughs> in the Kingdom of England. The castle. And, and Ireland. <laughs> uh, we're voting for everyone who will be at, uh, at uh, King voting, Arthur's You're voting table. for all the lords and ladies yes. here. Uh, we're going to be there, uh, me, Matt, and Amber, for a few UK election special shows. On Monday, December 9th, we will be at Bush Hall in London. And on Wednesday, December 11th, we will be in Liverpool, England, at the Liverpool Philharmonic Music Room. You can find tickets to these shows at gigrt.rs slash cta <laughs> that <sounds laughs> very legitimate <laughs> we're going to put it the yeah, link in the, okay. in the description there's a link in the yeah, description you, uh, t- payment is only taken in bitcoin and ethereum <laughs> this is like <laughs> uh, no we'll, we're, we're back for you know we, we were last there about six months ago and uh, you know we thought we were about to go on this um, uh, 15 city tour of the south uh, but then <laughs> they called an election and he said, no, we, we've got to go back to yep. where we just were six months ago and do exactly two shows <laughs> uh, in Liverpool and London right on the eve of your election where, you know, we, we hope uh, we hope the absolute boy wins. We will never be able to go to the south. Like, do we're sorry, but it just never we want happened. to so badly. Yeah, we really want to. But it's just uh, legally impossible for us now. Ooh, I had my hopes set on going to St. Petersburg. Oh, oh rats. Well, I mean, it's due to the contract we signed that specifically says we have to tour all of Scandinavia, New Zealand, and Australia yeah. before we can even consider doing a date in Raleigh. Yeah. We're locked in. I, yeah, I really, really, really wanted to go to uh, Texas. I wanted to do a big <laughs> Texas tour. And um, so the, thi- the thing is, I'm doing this one, a 
series of one man shows in Singapore. <laughs> be unable to do it. So sorry. He's going to get caned on stage. <laughs> you, you're lucky you just got that fucking ticket in Glasgow. You throw your cigarette butt on the ground in Singapore, they're going to roast you out of spit. Did yeah, you, and I'll be a symbol of freedom for people. Did you pay that ticket? No, no right? It's not going well, back. No, well, the let's fucking cops are listening. <laughs> the fuck? Dude. Is that why you're not going? <laughs> 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 you're barred from the country. They've got your picture up at the I airport. Know, I, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, no, I was, I was actually, actually going to pay that because I was like, well, like this is like a very punitive country, and I could see myself not being allowed back in for not paying the smoking ticket. But I straight up lost it. <laughs> it happened. He looks. He has attachments in the U- UK. Yeah, this is my life. Is a John Le Carre novel. John, John Le, Le Carre. Car. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait. That's not even his real name anyway. He's getting yeah, the fake matter. name wrong. Yeah, you're right. What, no, he's, he's just being pretentious. You, he's talking about the, he's talking about the who, villain who? in Cars 3. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> who? Snooty French car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. John Le Car. You know, uh, hello, Mr. Speedy. I will defeat you at the big race. <laughs> I mean, I will say this about uh, John Le Lightning Le- McQueen. I will say this about John Le Car. He did just sign that open letter in The Guardian about how he can't possibly support Corbin's yeah. anti-Semitic. One sounds, a sounds, spook. sounds to me like he's in neutral gear. <laughs> Always a spook. You know, well, as you know, you know, election season, a lot of uh, there's a lot of cross talk, a lot of uh, you know, back and forth going on, and uh, we plan to be there for a week to uh, suss things out, uh, find the real anti-Semites, and bring you uh, the sort of election coverage that you're used to getting from Chapo Trap House. There's no one better to suss things out with than Matt Christman. <laughs> <He's laughs> so the king sad. of sussing out. I mean, I don't want to... No, no spoilers, but, I mean, Virgil, you will be announcing your official endorsement of Joe Swinson and the Lib Dem party. Uh, that is a spoiler. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know how you could possibly preface that statement with no spoilers. Well, you know, I'm trying, I'm just, I'm trying to sell here, dude. All right, well, we've got a... Uh, a Chapo uh, Royal Flush uh, here today. It's a it's a full house. Uh, we're all here, and why don't we uh, kick things off this episode? Uh, Amber has just recently uh, written a piece in Jacobin about the um, I don't know how you describe it a phenomenon con scam scam yeah. that is uh, we work. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're probably aware of them, but uh, just to kick things off, Amber, you begin your article as I think all you know American. Any, any piece of serious American cultural or political analysis should begin with an extended uh, metaphor relating to uh, The Simpsons and the town of Springfield. Yes. Could you discuss? So um, I like to use a literary frame to discuss current politics. Sometimes it's children's books, sometimes it's The Simpsons, and really just those two things. But The Simpsons, I have the extended theory that there are three Springfields, and there's Springfield the good. It's when they, they all get together and, you know, march out to maybe get hit by a meteorite or it's when they unionize or whatever and they're noble and egalitarian. Um, there's Springfield the mob. We've already, we know exactly what that is. They, you know, smash snakes in the middle of the town or, or whatever, leave Bart in a, in a well. Um, but then there's like Springfield the suckers and uh, it's, it's, it's the most fun premise for a Springfield and it's when the entire town gets duped into something really stupid because they're a bunch of marks and rubes and I think there's kind of it kind of betrays like a an ambivalence towards populism but it also is just like the best it's just the best episodes it's the monorail episode where they're dumb and they get taken by Landley the casino episode another one of my favorites it's fantastic I mean like those I think that there's some of the best episodes when the entire you know when the entire town gets taken by by a con um, but my argument is actually that, like, actually elites are, like, the biggest suckers. Um, and the WeWork thing is probably the best example of that ever. It's better than, it's better than Fire Festival. It's, it's better than fucking Theranos. Because at least with that, you could be like, well, I guess I don't really know how blood works. So, <laughs> you know, like, like, you could sort of, like, get why people didn't get that. But or Fire it, Festival. Fire for, Festival, yeah. yeah. It's just like, I don't know. There's a bunch of celebrities attached. I'd want to see Ja Rule, too. Sure. Who wouldn't? Um, the Delvey thing. I mean, she's obviously, like, free. She's a folk hero. Free Anna Delvey. All she did was steal from like, super rich people. Who is Anna Delvey again? Oh, God, she was the fake heiress. Oh, right, right, right. And she's like, I am 
raising funds to make a club that is <laughs> it is for art. It's going to have art, but then also it is a dance club, but then also it is a hotel and then and a also, co-working space. And it's it's all of the things. It's like it's like the most like confusing European rich people business idea in the world. And she really did believe in it too. And she ruled and she ne- she never apologized at at her trial and everything. So I I don't get why like Elizabeth Holmes is walking around in Anna Delby's and Rikers. But nonetheless, WeWork, I think, is the best one because it is the biggest, dumbest scam of our era. So, it, so you know, we have these figures like Elizabeth Holmes, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Fire Festival guy, Billy McFarlane, yeah. and then Anna Delvey, who's sort of like a, a modern Patricia Highsmith character. Yeah. Yeah. She's amazing. So, uh, you know, added to this canon now, we have a guy named Adam Newman. Oh, Adam Newman's amazing. When I started reading about this, I started reading the coverage in FT and then Business Insider. And I think one of the reasons like people aren't paying much attention to this and how weird it is is because it most of the reporting comes from FT and Business Insider and it's all subscription stuff. And I'm the only person who actually reads FT and Business Insider. But it had this... It, they, they've just been covering these slow leaks forever of just the like rapid downfall of this place. And so much of it is tied to this insane person, Adam Newman, who is, I think I described to Felix, the most Israeli man ever. So he's like- Just by looks alone, yeah. Oh my God. So it's like, it's kind of like this weird, I think like Noah Colwin had the best line where he said like, like Israel culturally is the fast fashion of Judaism. (laughs) (laughs) Like he said, it's like a a whole country was (laughs) H&M. And like that really covers it. So like Adam Newman is is this particularly ki- type of like Israeli guy who's like an alpha hippie jock or like half like, you know, kibbutznik, half IDF. And he's not actually, he wasn't IDF. He was in the Israeli Navy, which I don't even know if that's better or worse. I don't know what the intra like. I think the Israeli Navy just stops people in Gaza from going fishing. I think that's kind of it, right? Yeah. Okay. So he's, um, first thing, barefoot guy. Serious ba- barefoot guy. Like, not like, like the, they would talk about him walking around the office barefoot, just drinking $140 bottles of tequila, but also barefoot on the streets of Soho in New uh. York. He was a, ba- he's a fucking barefoot as legal guy. In the New York streets, Ooh. which I'm sorry, like, I know we talk a lot about how the police are overly punitive, but, like, arrest anyone who does that immediately. That's a broken window. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, an insane eccentric guy. He was, um, like, there's just so many stories and shit, like, that comes out from him. But he was, like, a psychopath who had this deranged idea of, like basically ruling the world and creating a, an empire that he would pass down to his children, like in the children's children, like indefinitely. And it was based entirely off of just like real estate. There was nothing interesting about it. It had this really dubious designation as a tech company because they like tracked what the, the we workers were doing, but like, like any co- workplace does data. that now. Yeah. So that's what makes it a tech company and not just like a new kind of slumlord. Yeah, but like any anyone else also, like there's like keystroke stuff Logging. in any office right. stuff. Like it's all, ev- everyone's Uh-oh. being tracked all the time. Yeah, yeah, we're all being tracked. I don't know who's doing it, but one of us is tracking all the rest I'm of us. I'm doing it. I can okay. like stop if you guys want. <laughs> <laughs> Was that bad? <laughs> but uh, like just, just to, here's an incredible detail that you had in this story about this Adam Newman guy. Again, before he got into WeWork, and I want to get into like what actually that was and like what his plan or vision for this yeah, co-working space is. It's so hard to figure out where to start. Yeah. Two incredible details is that before he got into WeWork, Adam Newman's first billion dollar ideas were a collapsible woman's shoe. I lo- tried to find as much information on this as I possibly could because I don't know what that is. As a woman who often wears shoes that were designed for women, I don't know what he means. I assume it's like, uh, I don't know, like, like a dress shoe that, you know, when you did that's uncomfortable. So, you know, you want to take it off at the end of the night, you know, like uh, like 4 a.m. on New Year's Eve. You see women like holding their <laughs> high heels on the subway. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's so a hot look. Why would he take that away from us? I guess he thinks that's not uh, efficient. He wants to make them more portable. <laughs> what, what if, if, okay, 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 okay. It's like woman. She got her high heels on. Like this is the commercial for I'm joining him in his shoe <laughs> venture. Um, 
the first like twenty seconds of the commercial, just her feet. <laughs> <laughs> no sicko like, shit. What is this, this selling? Isn't, this is nothing. No sicko shit. But like, she's walking around. She's like, you know, I've got your reports. I've got the productivity sheet. You know, I don't know what people do in an office. As far as I know, they're just sort of like using AOL and Instant Messenger all day. I don't know what goes on, but we can fill that in. And she's just pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. And you see like her shoes against like the like wingtips of the guy with the corner office. Again, I've never worked in an office. I don't know. Uh, and then cut to Olympic platform in like a CrossFit gym that's like CrossFit, Everosity. You know, one of those made up words they use for the gym. And she like removes the heel part and but like fucking puts on like a flat part right. and boom, they're Olympic lifting. They're shoes. like tactical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And oh. then then like we're still on her feet. We're still on her feet. <laughs> <laughs> this commercial is twenty five minutes long. <laughs> and she's at a the Bushwick art show and she turns them into foam posits or some shit. I don't know. But that's that's what you would you do them for. Well, I think you're getting at what you know what I discern from this is that, you know, he walks around barefoot in the fucking streets of New York. He's obviously a foot guy. Like he's just trying he's to clearly in, got a foot thing. He's yeah. just trying to invent something that'll give women another excuse to take off their shoes in like social or public settings. Definitely. Even more insane than the collapsible woman's shoe though. His second big idea was baby clothes with padded knees. What what what's up? Yeah. What's up, man? <laughs> uh, a, a few other people have noticed that this is quite sus. Um, <laughs> but my my thing is that it was just like okay, even not looking at the susness, like don't babies already have like padded knees? I mean, I I, I guess the idea is kids like they hurt their they hurt their knees while they're learning to crawl. But they I've don't. seen a lot of They're... babies, and I've never seen one with scabs on their knees. I don't think it's a real issue. No, it's not. It's not an issue facing the baby community. Yeah, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be very low on the baby list of demands. I know. I mean, I've, I have I consider myself a member of that community. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, so yeah, he, he tried uh, a bunch of dumb shit basically before yeah. being like, "Well, what if I just did real estate?" It's like, so what? What was? What is? I mean, I think we're all vaguely familiar with WeWork, but like, mm-hmm. what? What actually? How did he break into this? This brilliant idea. Well, he started out with like buying one building in New York and breaking it up into smaller spaces and renting them out. You know, real groundbreaking shit. That's disruption. Yeah, it's total disruption. And it did well enough that he actually sold that first business and then started WeWork with a second partner. Um, and he had a um, lot of early investors because there is some there there is like a lot of number uh, data to suggest that like people do spend money on co-working spaces. Some of it was pretty cost prohibitive. The fact that a lot of these were in like the most expensive real estate in the most expensive cities in the world meant that it was sort of ridiculous. So the big thing it ended up um, that ended up selling WeWork is that it was like this this like luxury office experience. Where it was just like there was like kombucha on tap and like you know that's I don't know like it, it was just all all of those perks that you I don't know it's insane to me because I think of something like Fordlandia do you know what Fordlandia was remind me of that Henry Ford started a company town of like of a, like a rubber plant in the middle of the like the Brazilian jungle and that worked out great. Yeah, it went in and then everything was fine. It was a great idea. So it was like fraught with problems from the get go. And eventually the thing that um, incited the employees to riot was that they built a cafeteria and the employees were like, oh, you're trying to keep us here when we want to go home during our lunch break. So they just like tore the place up. Now, cut to like 2019, you have a bunch of like cocked tech workers being like, oh, it's amazing. I never have to leave work. I can eat here all day and I could bring my dog and blah, blah, blah. So like the domestication of the American worker is like a horrifying thing, but it is a pretty good business model for a certain type of worker. The problem is he completely overestimated the number of people who could afford or even wanted to do something like this. Uh, you're right here. Uh, they spent a ton on marketing, believing that they were destined to rake in a rentier's ransom from freelancers, gig workers, and small business owners with a key and eye for startups. Hey, why not build your tenuous bubble on a whole bunch of other smaller, even more tenuous bubbles? It's the dumbest thing in the world. If you explained it, like if you just like pulled someone off the street and explained the premise and like growth pattern of WeWork, just like a random person, they would be like, this stupid. And isn't it by now one of the number one 
tenants in like San Francisco, New York, Chicago, like yeah, a ton of major and like, cities. I think Hong Kong. They're, they're, making they, much they're, London. Uh, they're yeah. like one of the number one tenants, which means <laughs> that when it was looking like it was going to all collapse, it's like, oh, we're just going to have another housing crisis. Yeah. Uh, or another uh, like in the in the retail sector this time caused right. by just like, yeah, every building. Half the buildings occup- rented in downtown New York and Chicago are They're by fucking this company. Empty. Yeah. So, like, I mean, there is a, a germ of an idea there, which is there is this like growing class of like urban precariat, like you know, of what a previous generation would just work in an office, but are now pretty much the cords have been cut and they're all just kind of on their own. Yeah. And, you know, let's be honest, working in a coffee shop sucks. You know, none of those people are actually working. <laughs> well, and the wing is fake and it's all just a bunch of like girls going in to design handbags on laptops in a place without desks. So they're uh, also going under two, by the way. So how like we work is basically just like a slightly less exclusive version of the wing. Do you what I didn't yeah. get about it is like you 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 become a member of WeWork and you essentially like have a part like a membership to be going to any WeWork location or are you just literally renting so you like can a rent chair? A specific desk. You can rent a whole office space. You can rent stuff where it gives you rights to like like a voucher to schedule time in the conference room. Like it's it it is like a community office with all of the um uh like problems that would entail. <laughs> Like uh, I see that you booked um, the the Sagittarius conference room for four thirty, but ooh, like do you think you move it to C- the Capricorn space? Uh, yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm having like a we're having a dog uh, party in there. Did uh, you see so that? It was already like thin gruel, but then they were like, "Well, let's expand to absolutely everything." And they started doing fucking apartments and gyms and an elementary school, like this terrifying dystopian elementary oh, God. school. Wait, let me find this in. Hold on. In the meantime, do you remember that? Uh, Twitter thread. I don't know if anyone saw this. So somebody had a WeWork space for their company and it had a sliding glass door and there had been a umbrella on the wall. And when they went to close the door one day, the umbrella fell and lodged against the end of the sliding glass door so they could not open it and no one could figure out how to get in. And so they were just paying for the space that they couldn't use for weeks, <laughs> staring at the umbrella, and no one knew what to do. And there was no staff to so figure it they out. So don't, they ran out of staff a lot. Um, that so, there's so much shit that happened that it couldn't even make it in there, but like they, they had to employ a bunch of like cleaners and maintenance people that were like non-union who eventually went on strike, and then they didn't have the money to pay them. And at one point, one of the better like leaked memos was like to the cleaning staff and it was like so they have like free on-site mouthwash at WeWork obviously but they were running out of money to fill the the complimentary mouthwash stations so one of the memos to the cleaning staff was please don't put glass cleaner in the mouthwash station <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I actually I take responsibility for that I have um I have, the uh, same you, guys, you guys know I have a tech company called we wash <laughs> and what we do is we rent mouthwash from CBS <laughs> <laughs> uh, multiple uh, retailers uh, using horizontal integration <laughs> And uh, several facets of production, vis 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 the the Six Sigma management theory, <laughs> and we what we do is we rent mouthwash to WeWork, mm. and then like when people spit it out, we collect it from the graves, <laughs> put it back, <laughs> and we sell it back That's to so CBS. Disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know there was because of errors with horizontal integration, we did perhaps sell them glass cleaner, yeah. but. Our um, our R and D team is proving that those are the same thing. <laughs> All right, no, so like here's another thing you bring up is the the cult like aspect of the management of this company in that this Adam Newman guy. Uh, staffed all the most important positions with his close family members and friends who were all fanatically devoted to him. Insane and, people. And, and, and sort of like a, a belief not just in making money, but in a kind of like pseudo ideology of, of this guy and his Oh, company. they were pretty sure they were gods. Like it was absolutely insane. Like the fact that he was going to pass down the company in perpetuity to like his descendants, like some fucking vassal lord. The, the guy was completely, like, he had an absolute God complex. And for some reason, people believed him. Well, I mean, the, the other, the, the got some press around this uh, is, of course, his wife, whose name is Rebecca Paltrow Newman, who is indeed the cousin of Gwyneth Paltrow. Also um, studied uh, Buddhism and business at Virgil's alma mater of Cornell. <laughs> That's not a major. <laughs> <laughs> but you say here, uh, Rebe- Rebecca Paltrow Newman, 
was brought on board and given the title of strategic thought partner. Hot. When they're together, when when him and uh and the guy and <laughs> Gwyneth are together and all their friends, that is the least vaccinated room that has ever existed. <laughs> No, no one is less vaccinated. When than we that. get together, it's the most vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. But no, you talk about how uh, Rebecca previously, th- this is blood chilling, opened a private, quote, conscious entrepreneurial elementary school in New York. <laughs> the tuition ranged from $22,000 to $42,000 a year. Jesus Christ. That was ho- with the mission of attracting parents with this mission statement. We are committed to elevating the collective consciousness of the world by expanding happiness and unleashing every human's superpowers. Mm -hmm. If you could spend $22,000 a year on your kids' fucking elementary school, they don't need superpowers. They already have them. (laughs) Yes, loving parents. (laughs) Uh, You said, of course, uh, this elementary school is closed after a year. Yes. Yes, it did. And all of the the gyms closed. Like, uh, the apartments, no one went to rent them. Like... And they can't even fill the WeWork spaces. You also mentioned about how Adam Newman's dad would sit in on board meetings, even though he wasn't officially a member of the company. And what you like, this is exactly like Rob Reiner's character in Wolf of Wall Street, (laughs) where they just bring in one guy's dad to just sort of sit in. Yeah. And you compare it to Wolf of Wall Street, like the kind of uh, the antics among the the company parties and things like that. But it's, it's like Wolf of Wall Street, except not cool. It's not cool. And also like, in Wolf of Wall Street, they thought they were like kings. At WeWork, they thought they were gods. <laughs> like they wanted to elevate the consciousness of the world. Yeah. It's Oosh. like Ma Nan Sheila shit. <laughs> like <laughs> fucking Om Shimrikyo. So for, uh, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope they don't. <laughs> we work announces exciting new transportation <laughs> venture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, we talked about putting WeWorks on Mars, a seasteading WeWork. Even Elon Musk was like, "Nah, man, you're too weird for me." <laughs> like, like um, Shinrigo. Yes, they exactly. Yeah, uh, well, I don't have an idea. In the wild, my greatest dream is one day people will do paperwork on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Again, all through what is, the basic idea is a, a a coffee shop with laptops that you pay extra to go to, yes. and pretend to work all day. Yes, yeah, yeah, and they somehow trick people into it being referred to as a tech company, which it really just isn't. It really just fucking real estate. But like the uh, SoftBank, who like bankrolled a lot of the shit. Originally, it was like traditional like real estate, you know, people. It's who who you would expect. But then SoftBank who's like half of their it's the biggest private lump sum of money ever created and it's all from the Saudi royal family <laughs> for cubicles <laughs> the, is, cubicles. the Sauds don't know what it was they just really liked um this this guy uh son who headed up SoftBank because he after the the Khashoggi thing he kept his meeting with the crown prince when everyone else was like, Oh no, I just found out I have some place to go. And he was like the one guy who's like, Hey, let's just like meet in a quiet place. And they're like, here's 45 bajillion dollars. And so like, by just saying like, I'm not put off by that whole dismemberment thing. They basically got a blank check because like in, in, in the crown prince's eyes, this like, you know, legitimized them as a business venture or whatever. Loyalty. Yeah, loyalty. Um, I want to just favor the, shit. Like you said, like uh, the the shady sources of the money and the actual like fraud and con going on here. There's so much fraud. But, but what, what were some of the examples of the um, sort of rowdy uh, sort of corporate culture of Adam Newman and his like, you know, cult of. Yeah. So like, it started out really early with like what my mom calls mandatory fun which like is a thing in a lot of office spaces where it's like, okay, well, we're doing a retreat now, which means you don't get to go home. You don't get to like, you know, you have no work like life division. It's like now we're going to have a retreat. We're all going to have fun. And like in a very early one, they ran out of like firewood for an upstate thing. And so Adam Newman just starts throwing furniture onto the fire. Who's furniture? Like the, the resorts. (laughs) And um, people were like, wow, this guy is crazy. That's insane. And like, it was kind of like a little legend. And then things got completely insane because they started getting, they, their valuation by the end of it before it plummeting was $47 billion, which is an absurd, absurd, absurd valuation. But like, by the end, they were just doing like, 
what's what's a music festival? I'm I'm punk. I go to see music indoors. I don't know what this music festival is. Lollapalooza. Lollapalooza. Oh my god, you're so old. Bumble, <laughs> Bumble shoot. Uh, fun, fun, fun. Uh, hullabaloo. Uh, that one. <laughs> tid, tid the season in Buffalo this December. We're going. Uh, I mean, like it it it, it was. Whatever one of the what are the British ones? They still do All tomorrow's party. Oh, the Reading uh, Festival. No, yes. uh, Glastonbury. All tomorrow's party. Glastonbury. So they were just doing Glastonbury. Yeah. And where they would just literally have like thousands of employees, and they would hire like Florence and the Machine and like the Chain Smokers or whatever Ugh. that terrible band is. They, both of those bands, those of those people actually played. Um, although I do like Florence and the Machine. Nonetheless. They would play, and you would. They they made them all camp outside and have this experience oh God. that was like their Ugh. bounding thing. And like your accommodations depended on how much you were willing to spend out of pocket. So some people got to stay in these like luxury yurts, and then there's this like other woman who has this story where she said she woke up and she was just in a regular like TP style tent, and she saw like the piss collecting at the top of the tent and just hope that it wasn't going to leak through and fall on her head because everyone was just like vomiting and sh- like shitting and like having sex at this company retreat in a fucking filthy field. And by the way, no plastic straws or meat were allowed. Oh, this sounds a lot of fun. So, like this is something I've, I've noticed. Someone pointed this out the other day on Twitter, but that companies in the last decade or so have really emphasize that they're replacing any outside of work social life that you have. Yeah. And and it is, I mean, it's stuff like this and it's, we works like the most ridiculous example, right? Because they're making you, they're making you go to like a shittier version of Woodstock. And pay to do it. Right. And pay to do it. And pay to do it. And, and it's, and it's somehow filthier and more disgusting and a bigger corporate liability. (laughs) I mean, it's like, it is, like, this guy's obviously a fucking dumbass, but... He's insane. He's everyone insane. else, like, every other company that does this is, like, it's actually, like, pretty cynical because everyone's horribly lonely and everyone has this, like, spiritual desire for community. And so after companies like this, any number of companies that people work for have eroded that, have eroded, like, any sense of togetherness you'd have with people because every moment of your life is already spent working or worrying about work worrying about like the next 50 years you have to work so you won't be fucking homeless they're making it so that your entire spiritual need is filled at the workplace doing th- doing things like fucking after hours happy hour or workplace karaoke yeah and it's like not quite as insidious as the employer provided health care thing but it's another thing that prevents you from ever fucking leaving yeah it's like they give me health care but also they give me a warm friendship hug yeah. And like you compare this to like Fordlandia, those people rioted the second they thought that their that their employers were trying to keep them on site for lunch. Remember that? And now yeah. we're like, oh, we get kind bars. It's horrifying. I, I, st- I the French wouldn't fucking stand for this. No. Remember They're like, I story? want my three hour lunch and I'm gonna get drunk and I might not come back. Remember that Wall Street Journal story about WeWork where they said that in twenty sixteen they had to lay off twenty percent of their workforce and oh, yeah. when they gave this, the announcement. This whole time they kept doing massive layoffs. <laughs> but when they gave the announcements in the room, they, they, he's like, we're laying everybody off. And then they brought out tequila shots and run from run DMC. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, you're fired. But here's some fresh beats. Yeah. <laughs> was, he, he always like had his like bottles of his $140 tequila around that he would like make people drink with him, like including during interviews, which means like one, I like I'm not even getting paid for this. And like you're making me this is like this is like fraternity hazing. Uh, can I speak to this effect from as somebody who has actually worked? Oh, on that's a WeWork? right. Mm. Uh, so you work on a big floor. There are like 20 companies there. You can't tell what anybody else does. And as far as they don't know o- either. Yeah, you can as, you can only deduce because every. Well, one s- of them was planning the fire festival yes. <laughs> uh, because every surface is glass. So you can see what everybody does. And you can only deduce that they're like se- selling like algorithmically generated jewelry that is, you know, like advertised exclusively on Instagram. But like every single day, a different one of these, this culture trickle, trickles down that every single one of the day, a different place is having like a party at lunch. Yes. So it's the constant effect of there being constant parties at your workplace or like puppy parades or some kind of like yoga teacher or leading a class that you yourself are not invited to because your workplace only gets one of those every other week. So it's this, this feeling of working in a giant playground that is constantly distracting, that is constantly taking up your conference rooms, but you still have to do work around it in this 
alienating, colorful, glass-filled space. It was yeah. a truly awful experience, and no amount of like you know to bully that I stole from other people's party leftovers could make up for, uh, <laughs> could make up for it in any place. But uh, you know, taking four minutes to walk from my unit to the cafeteria to get the complimentary cucumber water and walk back, I guess, absorb time of my day there. So that's part of it. I think also like the party stuff serves to like, you know, the mandatory fun on all this, like, you know, like ersatz, like intimacy serves to like quiet your, you know, maybe skepticism about the project at large because they've already started doing interviews with people who like left WeWork and they're like, they're like cult members. They're like, I don't know. It just seemed like it made sense at the time. But now I'm like $47 billion. What the fuck were we doing? Uh, just uh, th- This is another uh, detail, just speaking to the, uh, the, the fraud and the grift going on here. This is one of my favorite details. Uh, it says, in 2019, Adam Newman <laughs> trademarked the word we and then changed the name of the, his company to The We Company and then sold the rights to use it back to his own company for $5.9 million. Yeah. So he sold the word we to himself and used the company money to pay himself $6 million so that he could use yeah. the word we. And to the, to this date, that is the only thing he has ever gotten caught on where they're like, come on, man, that's a bridge too far. And so he just, after scrutiny, gave the money back. There has been like no amount of like, uh, you know, like legal action or anything. That's he was just like, okay, this is a bit much. That's just straight embezzlement. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. Um, so like overall, like, it's the overall, like, and, and you know, this this company is circling the drain now uh, because of you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's been a like. For, first of all, when you go back even two years into this, when it was already incredibly overvalued, every single fucking well, not every single, but most like American like business reporting were like, "Wow, it's disruption." And meanwhile, you have like these like stoic Brits at Financial Times being like, "This is stupid." And like well before they realized it was like a massive, ridiculous over overvaluation, they were like, "Well, let's compare this." to a competitor. So there's another company called IWG that has the exact same kind of business model. I mean, they're not trying to like build office spaces on Mars or whatever, but like the exact same thing they have, they own almost the same amount of real estate and yet they turn a profit. WeWork has never turned a profit. It has been hemorrhaging money since the get-go. They turn a profit and their valuation was at like, I can't remember the exact number, but something like six billion. And we were for some reason at 47 billion and they were a money pit. Like to the this this larger idea of like f- fraud, not just in like personal criminal sociopathy and you know messianic uh, complex, but the overall ab- absurd and distorted nature of our economy at large. You start with the idea that like a company that just basically rents cubicles to downwardly mobile, you know, urban precariat, yeah. you know, coffee sippers or whatever, uh, is valued at forty seven billion dollars. And got like their money from this like thing called soft money. That's a giant soft black bank. soft what? bank, yeah. Soft bank, yeah. <laughs> soft, soft, soft money. <laughs> My money real soft right now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a black hole of money yeah. provided by the Saudi royal family. Yeah, it's literally from their sovereign wealth fund. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, it seems like it's got to be just about propping up the housing market, nothing right? Will happen. Like, it's too big yeah. to fail. It's yeah. like we can't have the yeah. the rent retail housing nothing market will to in every American city collapse overnight. Yeah. And then it's like all of these Leviathan companies, like Uber and Amazon, that are like technically worth even more than that. On paper, don't even turn a profit. Yeah. yeah. Well, so a- Am- Amazon. Well, we but have, only because have, of uh, AWS. Also, yeah, it's true. That's we have true. also yet CIA to figure out contract. even yeah. what the what the profit uh, for data is. Like we're like, oh, this is gonna be the new thing, and but like that's a bubble too. You can't just keep selling what people like click on Instagram to everyone. That is a very limited like. There's a ceiling to how much money that will make you. People aren't just going to pay for information. Well, We've had this happen before with advertising, too, where we figured out that it's like, well, it kind of only sort of sometimes works. I don't know. Those yeah. tulips just seem to keep only going up in value. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is, I feel like the, I mean, the next financial collapse is going to be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But, but, it's going to be a bunch of Adam Newman's. Fucking- yeah, but like the, the, that is, I feel like that's the understated thing. And people will actually... I saw somebody talk about how there was like a big thing. There was a study about how online advertising mostly doesn't work. And one of the, I saw a, a fellow blue check uh, <laughs> <laughs> reply to this guy. And he was like, don't you know people's fucking entire livelihoods are on the line? 
I think everyone kind of knows online advertising doesn't work. Yeah. I think they everyone kind of knows that it's bullshit. Yeah. But every somehow we built everything on this now. So it's oh got to keep working. The yeah. data economy is so inflated and it's like, well, like, I don't know that like anyone's actually going to be able to make that much money off of how many like puppy videos I heart. My 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 family, they've known me for 29 years. <laughs> they talk to me every day. They get to listen to me when they're not talking to me. <laughs> they get to read just like whatever things I don't even think about saying before saying them on my timeline. And come Christmas, they I think they, they, they're still thinking like, what the fuck do we buy this guy? <laughs> <laughs> what does he like? <laughs> Who is this person? Oh, right. How well can this data work? I got a targeted Instagram ad the other day. Uh, Cajoling me to adopt a mind sniffing rat. <laughs> Do it. That's Do it, a, that's a rat that Get sniffs out minds. Marty will love him. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we'll you know, I think you guys are being too hard on this Newton guy. His he might be a fraudster. His whole thing might be moonshine, but it's all in pursuit of a greater good. I don't know if you saw this. I'm going to do my own little impromptu reading series here. Uh, an article today in the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Ex WeWork CEO Adam Newman helped Jared Kushner on Mid East Peace Plan. Oh, oh I talked okay. about this because uh, Ivanka and Jared uh, went to uh, Rebecca's uh, birthday party in Italy. They're all quite close. Well, it's funny that he's involved in Jared's Middle East Peace Plan because I remember reading that Jared Jared's actual like Israel Palestine like solution yeah. is literally we work for yes. Palestine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's yes. turning the West Bank into yes. a we work into a co Also space. another thing Adam Newman said because people were like, hey, isn't Saudi Arabia like bad? Eventually he said, well, I am doing more for Saudi Arabian women than any country because I am teaching them to code. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There, I want to read this. Okay, I want to read some parts here. There's because, just so much. No, there's some great quotes for this. So this is all like condensed from a Vanity Fair piece that came out uh, last week. The ousted CEO of WeWork, Adam Newman, believes a quote he was even capable of solving the world's thorniest problems, including the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Newman assigned WeWork's director of development, Ronnie Bahar, to hire an advertising firm to produce a video for Kushner showing what an economically transformed West Bank and Gaza would look like, <laughs> citing two una- uh, the magazine reported citing two unnamed sources. Bahar said he only advised on the video and no WeWork resources were used. Kushner used the video during the Bahrain cro- conference, which launched the economic portion of the Trump administration's peace plan. Uh, so he was like hanging out with him, Kushner, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and Stephen Hadley. Uh, Squad. And, uh, no, <laughs> so this is the best quote. So this, uh, so this all happened before the Khashoggi killing, and then that caused a big problem in the That's PR world. That was an oopsie doopsie. <laughs> and, uh, and Stephen Hadley was talking to... Uh, Longtime Bush administration, real heads know, deep, yeah. deep cut war criminal from the was first talking to Adam Newman and Adam Newman was despairing of this mistake that uh, that MBS had made and said that the bin Salman mess could have been a more avoided if bin Salman had the right mentor he said that mentor was himself <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently they're also involved in Kabbalah and a oh, bunch no, they're of uh, super Kabbalah. So they're, weirdo their guy their Kabbalah rabbi who they said was the rabbi and then wasn't their rabbi, and then they just named him the spiritual leader of WeWork and introduced him that way at a conference. That guy is in a ton of trouble for using basically like Scientology style abuse t- tactics to get donations to to like the Kabbalah Center. Yeah, I I love to work for a company that has a spiritual guru and <laughs> mentor. Oh oh oh. Great. I ran afoul of the company's wizard. Again. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to turn oh, me into a oh, nude for missing my uh, quarterly projections. So, G- Gavin and Warlocks is going to have my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amber, like, how, how did this all, like, how did the wheels start? Like, you, you know, Adam Newman has resigned now as CEO of work. Like, how did this all start? Yeah, he voted himself out, by so, like, the way. Like, how did this yeah. all start, like, falling apart? So they started to notice that um, they had like a direct comparable competitor and they started comparing the money and they were like, this is fucking stupid. It got way out of hand. Also, this isn't some kind of like new technology. It's real estate. It's office spaces. And like you have like just bar napkin math shows that this is completely (laughs) insane. Like you again, anyone on the street. 
would just be like, yeah, that sounds dumb. <laughs> but for some reason, business people are like, I'm so smart. Only dumb people think this is dumb. Well, Amber, like that gets to like how, how you sort of conclude the piece that I really like. Like thinking again about Springfield as a kind of body politic, right. and the sort of multifaceted representation of the right. best, worst, and you know, mediocre aspects of the American public. So Marge versus the monorail. Yeah, like yeah. The, 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 the fraud, the fraudulent element of this. I think like what you get at here is that like whether it's Theranos or this or like pretty much most of like the, I don't know, tech economy, yeah. there is no bigger mark in American culture right now than the wealthy. Yeah, they're just massive suckers because they're so, they're, first of all, they're completely isolated. So like even if they're wrong, there's no risk. Nothing's, they're accountable to no one anymore. They have like, their wealth is sometimes literally sovereign no one will hold them accountable for it Two, like they're just money drunk and have like these god complexes and like the weird thing about newman is like i think he's one of those people that like is so insane that he doesn't know he's grifting anymore like well that's what everyone is i mean look at the fact he was actually consulted by fucking world leaders yeah. on Panini's piece yeah. Yeah. i think that's bedeviled everyone yeah. in he's in, a moron in, meanwhile in politics it wasn't too like too long ago that he was like, oh, there are ethical concerns with getting money from Saudi Arabia. So he visited a fucking, it was one of these things too where he wasn't supposed to have, he would do these things where he would hide the, 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 the staff, the, the support staff to make the company look lean and he's, <laughs> he would make like secretaries and stuff like hide and not be photographed. Put a potted he, plant on their head. He wouldn't take them places and then, and then there was like multiple times where apparently like he's like, we're, we're traveling lean. It's just us. We don't need help. But then he would be like, go from New York to London and be like, oh shit, we need someone to make copies. So they would fly in a bunch of assistants <laughs> for, to work for six hours and then fly them they back hoping that no one would see the them. UK? I don't, yeah, I mean, like, I think there's just too high of labor laws there for him to be able to abuse them. But anyway, he goes to fucking um, LA to meet with uh, one, one of these, like, Saudis at, at his, like, L.A. mansion, and one of the people who was there who was, like, one of his assistants who, I guess, wasn't supposed to exist but eventually leaked this stuff was, like, yeah, there's just, like, a tiger walking around <laughs> <laughs> the fucking place. And in his mind, he's, like, you know, this is really a mentorship problem. I'm like, no, you should never be some... If you're, in a, if you're in a place where you see, like, James Bond bad guy shit, you're in a bad business. Yeah, no. If there's a trap door anywhere, do not hang around there. I think, but, but the fact that they're all just, like, you look at them and you're like, these people are delusional. They're, they're, yeah. they're this is this could never work. I mean, I mean, it, it, Ther- he got high is on his own good supply. Yeah. yeah, but it's just like it. It really tells you that the defining characteristic of this moment we're in, whatever we want to call it, like late capitalism or the twilight of the elites, or as uh, Felix would call it, the era of the sons, <laughs> is that everything's as everything winds to a, to a halt and like all these machinery stops working and everyone's too fucking stupid and complacent at the top to figure out how to fix it. Uh, they're just all deciding, well, I'll just believe the fantasy. Yeah. We're all, they're all just like eating the lotus. Like, yeah, no, we're just going to, because we have the money and we can afford to just keep doing this. And if we create something like we work, well, it'll eventually become so important to the real estate market that it can't collapse no matter how bad an idea it is. And so we're just going to keep uh, piling the money into these insane King Ludwig and fantasies and it, until eventually it just collapses. And also, no it's, one, they're off in it's also land. just like a better plan because like the intra elite grift, like who has more money to grift? Yeah, it's just they're all in cloud cuckoo land. Now. And you can you can never truly get grifted because everything is so interconnected that it can't actually collapse. Yeah, everything Nothing happened. But everything like, happened. Adam Newman literally like they were like, we have to remove this person. He is insane. He was just he would just like, by the way, like just Led Zeppelin trash his own we work places which is like the least cool way of being like a decadent fucking like he's like we man we played pac-man all night like it fucking sucked it fucking sucked it's so lame it's I the think, lamest way of being decadent you can imagine i think i broke the kombucha tap awesome dude <laughs> and like he was just he'll, he'll just be fine so they had just like a meeting where they're like you're insane and this is overvalued and this is going to be a huge disaster and he was like you know i think my own presence has become a distraction I would like to gracefully bow out. And they're like, here's $1.7 billion. <laughs> Nothing happens to you. He still gets consulting fees in the hundreds of millions of dollars. 
The whole thing is deranged. Nothing will happen to him. I mean, I guess like Masayoshi's son like lost his position at SoftBank. He's still worth billions of dollars. He is still a literal billionaire. Nothing will happen to these people. They are the biggest suckers in the world, and it doesn't even matter. The only way that this guy is going to be brought down is if he steps on a piece of glass on Houston <laughs> Street and can gets it just gangrene. Gets rat and instead AIDS, of getting gets New York and, and, City and, rat AIDS, and of course not getting Western medicine and antibiotics, but just like st- jamming a crystal up his ass, yeah. and then he just dies. Well, That's I, the only his hope. His wife, when she was giving a speech as his whatever, at one point said strategic thought leader. Strategic thought leader. She said, um, "One of the most significant things about being a woman." is finding your soulmate and learning to support him and bring him to his vision. <laughs> so she's like, she, I, first of all, she can't possibly be his only wife. With language, yeah. with language like that, you know there's some other wives. Yeah, that sounds. I think that was I, a quote from Jim Jones's wife. Yeah. I, I feel like Steve Jobs should have been the canary in the coal mine for yes. this age because you had this guy who was as backstabbing, conniving, cynical, awful as any billionaire could be, uh, elevated to a godlike status. I mean, you saw those pictures of people weeping at Apple stores mm-hmm. when he died. And essentially but not for making anything new either. He didn't, he didn't make anything new. He just stole from other people. He fucked people over. But the way he died was <laughs> he thought he Steve was... Steve Juice. Right. He could, have, he could have lived easily. If anyone's going to live, it's him. But he thought he could out think the norms he could yeah. out, he thought he could outthink the only system that could benefit him dumbass suckers did. do chemotherapy yeah. <laughs> i'm not some fucking rube right hand me that kombucha <laughs> yeah he yeah so this guy who is like prided himself on being more clever than anyone around who like made the only real faustian bargain you can make which is just fucking over everyone you fucking know mm-hmm. just giving up any the any meaning of life having really no friends nothing no actual human connection for billions of dollars and to be worshipped as this visionary he died because he thought he was smarter than cancer he thought he was <laughs> yeah. he thought he could just shove naked juice up his fucking <laughs> asshole yeah, and there's, live there's, forever there's no Ooh. bigger sucker than the smartest guy in the room I remember uh, Fran Lebowitz saying that she knew it was all beginning to completely come apart when people started talking about Steve Jobs in terms that were previously reserved for like Da Vinci or Picasso, yeah. Yeah. Like artists of you know uh, world historical caliber. Um, but I guess just like to, to close out the WeWork thing, you sort of conclude by again like there's this is the w- vision of the economy that we have that WeWork is a perfect example of in which um, charismatic messianic lunatics. Uh, hoover up billions of dollars from uh, mass murdering oil oligarchs in Saudi Arabia, don't create anything, don't make any money, but still cash out for billions of dollars uh, because they made an office that said like grind hard every day and like, you know, (laughs) kind of like a courier font text Mm -hmm. art. Contrast that with, let's say, you know, an alternate vision of an economy that is democratically controlled and run in a collective self-interest. I don't know what the word for that is escaping me now, (laughs) but the knock on that is that like, you know, oh, like big government always wastes your money or like it's always kind of talked about in terms of being fraudulent or like a pyramid scheme. But it's like at the end of the day, the, like we, these feel like a collectively controlled economy, even if it's done by like, you know, classic stereotypical, you know, late era Soviet bureaucrats yeah. could not possibly waste our money no. more egregiously or dumber than these people. There's no way that the masses are dumber or bigger suckers than billionaires. You look at the way they get grifted and it's so much worse than like, you know, the average person could get grifted. It would be, and you know, I'm not talking about like, you know, everyone doing some big horizontalist vote, you know, to figure out uh, like how exactly we budget everything, but something where there was some level of accountability where people had to, where there were repercussions to someone for making it perhaps like a dumb mistake or a bad gamble Maybe that we could even just a little bit of a move in that direction economically and we wouldn't see like the degree of idiotic, decadent grifting that we now see with like the WeWork thing. It is the biggest, dumbest scam in American history and it is hilarious. 
Uh, be on the lookout, though, for uh, Chapo. We're opening a, a couple like satellite pop up office locations <laughs> in Brooklyn that are sort of like our sort of podcasting studios where like you can rent it from us. You know, we'll take a percentage of your Patreon, but we're helping you yeah. start podcasts in like creative pod spaces that are, you know, uh, f- for former tanneries yeah. <laughs> and, and radioactive watch uh, deposits from yeah. the Gowanus Canal. And it'll be fine because obviously your podcast will be a s- lucrative success and then like everyone wins. It's just like a never ending win. Yeah. Well, we'll be, char- uh, we'll be charging the- you rent for the podcast space, but also taking a percentage of whatever future earnings mm-hmm. uh, your podcast. And but we there's kombucha to- and once a week you get to hold our hands. Yeah, I will be, um, I will be starting a revolutionary new IUD sharing program. <laughs> <laughs> be on the lookout for that. Well, uh, speaking of accountability, I mean, there's accountability in the kind of uh, national or global economic and democratic sense. But way more importantly, there's accountability to your close relatives, family members, and friends. And there is no better time to make them accountable than, of course, Thanksgiving. Like, if, you've, if, if any relative, if your Mima or Pep Pep, has ever expressed any even mildly socially reactionary point of view, this upcoming week is the time to hold them accountable. There's nothing I enjoy more than going home to my, see my family on Thanksgiving, gather them around the turkey, and do a Maoist-style struggle session <laughs> where they get a giant piece of paper and write all of their year's crimes and, and uh, capitalist roading, and then wrap it around their head and hit them with shoes for a good two hours. <laughs> Thanksgiving is, of course, this week. Uh, it's, 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 it's Turkey day coming up. We're all going to be forced to spend time with our families. You know, I know that's, um, excruciating. Oh God. If you've got like an uncle who's a sock dem and one who's an ML, oh oh God, God. yeah, I'll be watching football in the other room. (laughs) I just want to grill. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's, it's, it's going to be excruciating. Like, you know, like these, these political discussions will come up. So I, I have created here for you. Uh, like I, I've come up with a couple of what I think are going to be some like stock counter arguments that you, our dear sweet listener, are going to have to put up with if you deign to share your uh, political beliefs or you know uh, opinions at the things at, at the dinner table. So I would like to I'm, I'm going I'm to pitch you the, these arguments, and we're going to do sort of like a chapo like uh, uh, snappy answers to stupid questions thing, and we're just going to sort of like go around. I'm I'm going to give you the the argument. And then I want you to come up with, uh, each of you come up with a, a either sincere or purposely vexing and mad and encounter argument that can be employed at will this coming Thursday. So, you know, I'm like, I'm, 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 these questions are pulled from like, you know, experience of like sort of a, you, a kind of a dirtbag Bernie supporter. I'm assuming you're going to go home to sort of, uh, maybe not full chud relatives, but, you know, sort of, uh, Democrat lib uh, relatives. Maybe we can do some versions of this for Chud relatives, but these are the ones I've come up with uh, for sort of uh, lib relatives and family members. Okay. Uh, First argument goes like this. You know, I really like Bernie, but I just think Warren is more realistic and will be able to really get things done in small incremental ways that overall adds up to meaningful change. And I just, I, I trust her more to, you know, really get things done. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> Let's go in a circle. Uh, Amber, what is, what is the first counterattack to that argument? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I actually just had this experience, so I'm very exhausted by it. And basically it involved me um, patiently uh, discussing policy with a beloved family member because I have a rule that I don't... Um, condescend or yell at anyone who I've ever vomited on um, because it's just basic filial piety Uh, so yeah I don't I don't really have also I don't have that many like super libs so like I'm actually happy when I get to talk to a lib uh, and not someone who you know like I would vote for Trump but he's a little too Jewish like that's really the problem like I a lot of my family kind of airs more in that direction Virgil, how would you attack this 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 sticky wicket? Uh, I would I would get up and I would leave. <laughs> I would uh, maybe I would fix it to go plate. Maybe not. I would go out in the living room, go out to the driveway, call an Uber, take it to the airport, just get on out of there. Yeah. I would uh, mute uh, all notifications on my phone in case people are calling me saying where are you. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, no time for that. Also, there's bars at airports now. Mm. Often you can smoke there. Felix, why don't you wake up? 
like I fucking love you so much, dog. But it's like, <laughs> how could you fuck? You're the real fucking drug addict. All of you are so fucking pathetic. How dare you look at me with those knives in your eyes when I only come here trying to bring love? That's good. Matt, shut the fuck up. Mm. Uh, no, that's. Uh, I would say that the the pseudo uh, pseudo sophisticated critique uh, uh, that these are more realistic is actually incredibly naive because everyone saying that is essentially forgetting the entire Obama administration. They're forgetting the fact that we now have a ideologically coherent Republican Party that has control of levers of power and uh, obstacles to legislation that are constitutionally, I mean, they're there in the Constitution that, that we never thought it would, it was not designed to have, this system was not, to co- was not designed to coincide with something like the modern Republican Party. So it has mechanisms within it to prevent anything from happening. So that means any political strategy that involves it does, winning an election and then trying to negotiate through the, the uh, halls of power as they currently exist, the U.S. Senate as it exists, the Supreme Court and the judiciary as they exist, is incredibly naive. You are not grappling with the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that only by radically restructuring the game, creating a political realignment that essentially uses popular participation to overwhelm the dikes that have been put up uh, in, in front of progressive change, uh, and then also to create points of leverage outside of government that can further that agenda, like through strikes and labor organizing, that that is the only realistic plan that is up to the challenge of dealing with the actual situation as it stands. I just try to stick to Medicare for all. Okay, well, well, well right, but they say, yeah. but that's they would okay, say, but I want that too. But hers is a better okay, well, way yeah, to get yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I just like this is like the thing is just like even I don't even zoom out to like large ideological things because my family will just like glaze over and go get drunk. Well, I'm just saying but this yeah. is specifically for the Warren people. Yeah. yeah. Is that they are t- their their point of view and what they're proud of is how they see they're more sophisticated than than Bernie and his blunt uh detailless agenda and I'm saying that the details that's picking that shit out of pepper. That's missing the forest for the trees. You brought up Medicare for all my next uh Thanksgiving uh argument is sounds like this. Sure, Medicare for all sounds good. I want everyone to have health care, but I like my private insurance plan. Why should I have to no, give you it don't. up? Shut the fuck up. Um, I think I'd say no, you don't. <laughs> like, I really do. Like, I'm like, all you do is bitch about it. Like, that's like one of the easiest. Again, it, it like I turn into a single issue voter at at like holidays because it's like the easiest thing for me to talk to like my conservative and liberal family about. Or just even the apolitical things, because it's just like it's so concrete. It's kind of a gift politically to have something to talk about. Whereas like one of my weird uncles will be talking about tort reform. And he doesn't really know what he is, but it's really mad. But like you can say healthcare, and people know what that is. And like I think going through like the five points of Medicare for all, it's just like, you know, this is superior. You know, this is superior to what you have. The only time you ever like your health insurance policy is when you're worried about other people getting free health care. Any other time, you're like, my fucking health insurance. And it's like, just imagine if you didn't have to deal with them. Virgil? You, I mean, you've already left, so... Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, you're at the airport. Yeah, you're at the yeah, airport. Yeah, yeah. Like you're I said, doing you, get, you get up and, and yeah. you get out of there. Don't even say a word. Don't even look them in the eyes. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't deserve that. You don't owe these people anything. Go to the airport. Block all their phone numbers. You know, uh, filter all their email addresses, have that directly go to spam or go to some kind of uh, Cialis uh, scam uh, Trojan horse uh, email re- auto response. Get on the plane. Turn your phone off. Put it on airplane mode. All the Hotel Transylvania films, you can watch them <laughs> on the plane. Pick one. You don't need to watch like the, the Hotel Transylvania's one through three to understand Hotel Transylvania four, in my experience. <laughs> Felix, generally, if someone says like, well, I like my insurance, and that's their argument against Medicare for all, like you, just, that person's just dead inside. You're not convincing them <laughs> on totally, anything. They're, they're lost. lying either to you or to themselves. They're lost. They're a lost soul. You're never going to get them back. Uh, you're just l- looking to fight. It's 28 days later. You, you know, if you had a gun, you should shoot that relative. <laughs> but, you, you know, you don't. 
You don't. You have to fly to Thanksgiving. And thanks to, you know, cuck transportation laws, you can't take your gun to Thanksgiving, even though it's the most likely time for a kinetic self-defense scenario. <laughs> so what you do is you become an agent of chaos. <laughs> and there, what that means is your youngest relatives, just start telling them at random that they're adopted, <laughs> especially if they're not. Just sort of create mayhem, and that will heighten the contradictions, the turkey day contradictions. And by the, by the end, when your uncle finally leaves, he will not have his health insurance anymore. <laughs> Also, by the way, fun fact, my grandpa has a picture of Donald, a framed picture of Donald Trump in his house. He is basically a lifelong Republican. He is completely insane and he unequivocally supports Medicare for all. He has what I like to call Tulsi energy. He's a little, he's like, you think he's going to zig, but then he zags. So uh, I would tell them. Uh, if I didn't think that they were completely dead inside, I would say you don't like ha your health insurance. You like having health insurance. You like being able to have it. And if you had Medicare for all, you would still have health insurance. It would cost you way less and it would be more comprehensive. And if they said, no, I really like it because of my network or something like that. It's all about like keeping your own doctors. Well, then you pull out the Matt Bruning card, which is that you, uh, in, if, if it, as it most likely is, if it's employer insurance, then your employer controls that, and they can change it whenever they want to, and they always do. Very few people keep health insurance for very long because every few years the company goes, yeah, we can save a few cents you know, a day on this, so we're switching to a different provider. And then you have no, no say in it at all. So the system doesn't even give you the certainty that you think it does. I, my, see, my response to this is like the, the sincere response is that all of this is based on the confusion between healthcare providers and healthcare insurers. Right, yeah. Yeah. In that, like, what you like is your doctor mm -hmm. or having someone be there for, you know, when you need it. Yeah. But nobody actually likes their health insurance. My actual, actual response is similar to Felix's. We've all intuited this. If you personally, sincerely like your private health insurance plan, <laughs> it should be taken away from you and not replaced with anything. You should just have your health care taken away from you as punishment for being like that. <laughs> for oh, being yeah. a, an insurance company cuck? Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but no one does. No one really does. Like, no one's like, what a, what a great business. All right. These are, these are, these are as you'll see, like, the, the way I'm imagining, these are all variations on a theme because, you know, it's basically the same arguments are going to come up, up again and again, but you have to be, have variations on the answers. And the other big one is going to be the pseudo clever retort that, come on, you know, Bernie's not really going to, all these things he's promised, you know, he's, there's no way that's going to pass Washington, right? Yeah. So, like, nothing's going to happen. He's not going to get anything done. It's not realistic. My, my response to being scoffed at is usually to scoff back. And like, you can kind of psych people out. I mean, whatever. We're getting into Amber's weird, intense psychological family drama here. But to just be like, you're like, oh, you, you don't really think that. I'm like, you don't really think that he can't get elected, can you? Like, you just kind of have to scoff back. And you're like, he's one of the most popular politicians in America. You like, have to sort what's of... Your Aikido it and make uh, their point of yeah. view seem childish and unrealistic. Yeah, yeah t tis you who is bitch made. I usually do a uh, kind of tautological retort to that, which is basically being like, not with that attitude. It's being like, you are the one who is willing these things not to happen, especially with my family who are like, well, I agree with all these things. It would be great if we could have free college, free Medicare, free all these things. But, you know, we, I, how it's never going to happen. We'd be like, you are the you are the one being the problem. That's, in, that's in this a very situation. good one, actually. That's like a much more wholesome version of what I do where I'm like, what are you fucking dumb? Of course he can win. Uh, anyone else got some counters to this one? Yeah. Your family members are essentially strangers. You have no bonds with them except for, <laughs> you know, the accident of birth. Move, fly to Toronto. Just meet up with a gang of bohemian queers. Adopt them as your new family. Smoke PCP. Plot elaborate heists with them. Yo, does that, uh, does that uh, cautious skepticism get you any pussy, bro? <laughs> <laughs> does that, uh, that sort of like reason incrementalism, you just whisper that in a girl's ears, she just writhes in anguish, bro? <laughs> does it get them wet when you talk about like realistic legislative goals, homie? I bet you're fucking crushing that, uncle. Uh, I I got three words, President Donald Trump. Here you go. How do you say possible. with confidence that you think you know what's realistic in politics when Donald Trump is the president of the United States? Mm -hmm. 
It happened. I know everyone's trying to pretend it didn't, or they fucking Russians uh, did the Konami code on our fucking election <laughs> servers or something. But he, he fucking won. Uh, something that no one thought could possibly happen in 2015 even. It was a joke. It was a Simpsons punchline 20 years ago. And it happened. How the fuck do you know it's possible and realistic? Nat has already ruined Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is how to prevent you know, having a good time playing with the Xbox Connect later. <laughs> no, but it's, it's a good answer, though. It I, is like literally like, look, we've already proven that everything is possible. Yes, everything is possible. Right, no, I, everything is permitted. Everything under the sun. Okay. Nothing, here, here, is, here, here Nothing two, is true. Here are two quick ones. Bernie's just too old. He's 76, just had a you know, mild to semi-serious heart attack. He's too old. You know, we can't he can't just drop dead and, all, you know, like, you know, he's too old. I just say he has two big, new, beautiful baboon hearts and he'll be fine. Once you've done so many drugs that you no longer live within the frame of this reality, move to a cabin in the woods. <laughs> Go insane there. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what place that you're in. Every room is interchangeable. And let this be the last room that you ever see. Virgil's Thanksgiving plan is just the movie Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> She, he's running against a guy who is just big mac of cheese in a yeah. fucking uh, in a jello mold. I mean, he's they're all old as shit except for Mayor, Mayor Pete, who's the fucking uh, Damien in the the Sam Neill uh, Omen movie. All right, well, this is my this is my last one, and again, this is I'm really tailoring this to like my own experience. But uh, Pete Buttigieg, I mean, he's just so smart. <laughs> <laughs> he's just uh, he's so clearly like he, I think we just need a smart young go getter like him. I have I like I have a like a, a Buddha judge uh sibling. Um mainly because I'm from Indiana and we really don't have a lot going on. <laughs> um but I did actually I was there recently and um I saw exactly one Buddha judge sign. I don't think anyone knows who he is there. Like there's like this weird brief initial identification with him. And I think what people actually do like about him is that they're like, oh, he's like a troop, but he's gay, but he's from the middle of the country. He has something everyone likes. Like, no, this is a one size fits none little asshole. But like, what about like, uh, uh, he, he's just so he's smart. No, he's dumb. What is the proof of this? He speaks all those languages. No, he he's doesn't. Crazy. That's what he's lying. He's a Rhodes Scholar. Yeah. So the fuck what? We Who should also just like just talk about how he's a massive liar. He got good grades. He's big a massive deal. liar. Um, he has fake if they say that, punch him in a he's, fucking he's, locker. He speaks fake Norwegian. He has fake black friends. He like, no, he's just a massive liar. Uh, if you if you have a relative that is speaking highly of Pete Buttigieg, Speaking more, you know, again, this is a very Will specific thing. Speaking to Will's specific situation, if they're speaking highly of people to judge, it is a good idea to back them into a corner and ask them what happened to Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> <laughs> because they probably know they were probably involved. At least they might have some intel. I will say this: uh, I was going to say it if we didn't get to it. Uh, if you do have MAGA relatives like I do, mm -hmm. Epstein. That's it. Just talk about Epstein. They, they, they're just, all. They already have a thing. For no, that. of course they do. But no, you just keep talking about it. You just keep talking about Bob Barr. Talk about his dad. Uh, talk about the whole. Just talk about the DOJ and and how they've ruled it a suicide. And Alexander Acosta. Yeah, Acosta yeah. and Trump. Just talk about all of it. And they can like they'll just give you Pepe's back or whatever. But. I mean, it's just it's just a, do you really want to argue about fucking single payer with some fucking uh, MAGA dip shit? No, that's tedious. Talk about uh, whether or not you can strangle yourself and, yeah, you know, like uh, a, and underground bubble cities and shit like that. Choose your battles. And when it's not worth having, just like make up conspiracy theories of your own and like have fun with it. Like just have a good time. Enjoy your family. Over the yeah, over Thanksgiving. Me, yeah, me and my yeah. grandsons, we're going to meme on our soy relatives. <laughs> we're going to just meme all over the cucks. We've made a groiper of their late grandmother. They love her. They love the groiper. <laughs> we're going to have a great time. Oh, I'm just imagining Nana that there groiper. has been a funeral in the last three years where grandma's on the slab and there is a groiper on the easel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have been laughing about this idea. So, like, imagine, like, Suddenly, your your father and your children have a great relationship, but it's just to make you support Donald Trump. Like, how would you feel? You'd be like, it's kind of nice that they're working together, but they're making groipers and making really bad, like, fuck CNN parody rap songs to <laughs> sing to me. <laughs> I really, I, I wish it's impossible for this to happen unless it was like, you know, I get married and I have a father in law type thing, but uh, I kind of want this to happen to me. 
I like I legitimately sometimes like I I want people to argue with me and I will just take on positions I don't believe and just no one's that combative. No, it's unfortunate. You seem to have like a nice family. Yeah, they're too nice. The extended yeah. family is like too nice. I've yeah. said some. I like your I've, sister. She yells a lot. My sister has. But I can't you tell wanna, she's you angry. Wanna, you want to meet someone who can play contrarian corner. <laughs> my sister <laughs> is. She's had some of the best ones I've ever heard. But no one really takes us up on it. I don't know. This year, I'm just going to say that I believe in Gaulism. Hopefully, that gets some reaction out of somebody. But no, no one's. I'm the only person who's just really a rotten, like combative personality. So we'll see. And just don't break your brain. Just have a nice time. Eat too much food. Make shit up. If you if you can't convince anyone, like don't like waste your breath. I mean, you can have a good time, but you'll like be sacrificing an opportunity to, like I said, hold your grandparents accountable for you know the, uh, voting for Nixon in 1970. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, what do you want? Just like Elizabeth Warren did, by the way. Do you want to? <laughs> do you want to walk away from Thanksgiving leaving your uncle unred pilled, not going his own way? <laughs> so there you go. I. Uh, Hope everyone, uh, both my co-hosts and you, the listeners, uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday, no matter how you choose to celebrate it, by abandoning your family and going to live in the woods to take, uh, you know, disassociatives like Virgil has uh, pitched yep. to, uh, you know, try to bedevil them through maddening uh, arguments you don't actually believe in via Felix. Uh, Succe- just- watching Succession is worse than being a concentration camp guard. <laughs> <laughs> Come to my Thanksgiving to find out why. <laughs> um, showing filial loyalty and chillness like Amber or just I'm um, screaming at them uh, like Matt. Or learning a hobo code. There you go. A dishonest man lives here. Uh, what do you say? Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Oh, and please check the uh, show description for our the upcoming uh, UK tour dates. UK, UK, UK. This will be metal, mate. It'll be bloody biscuits and gravy. Yeah, Matt will be doing this the whole time he's yes. in so country. Can't yeah. do it. So if, you, if you have any uh, hot tips about some big election stories, don't, don't tell, don't us, tell don't us. us. We don't care. <laughs>